All right, I don't know what y'all are in store for. Pastor's wearing a t-shirt. I don't know how this sermon's going to go. Uh, but today we're doing our core belief of salvation. We come back to these from time to time. Who here has read our core beliefs before? Who here has read them? I hope you have. They're very important. Uh, as we're celebrating American independence, what's great is in America, we can tell people this is what we believe and we think it's true. You go try that in a country like China, how does that work out? Mm -mm. No. We live in a place where we can declare we believe something and it matters. So from time to time, we readdress these core beliefs. So this is going to be one sermon, then you'll have your guest next Sunday, and then guess what? After that, we're teaching on Zechariah. So that's going, to be, that's going to be a weird one right there. Um, but come back for that. But uh, these are these core beliefs. If you desired to become a member at Bateman, uh, you would read through them, and then you would talk to our spiritual leadership team about that because we want to make sure that, one, you, you believe uh, somewhat like us. You know, if we believe in Jesus and you believe in spaghetti, maybe you don't believe the same as us. But also to have you ask questions of, do we actually believe what, what God's word says um, before you become a member? Um, but before we get into it, uh, we're, we're going to not preach the exact same sermon on our website. We're going to focus on these two words uh, as we talk about our core belief of salvation. We're, we're going we're to talk about the word for. Everybody say for. for. And we're going to talk about the word from. All right, so for and from. Excellent. All right, well, let's go ahead and have this next slide. We're going to read through our core belief. Uh, this is not God's word, so we won't stand for it, but it still matters to Bateman. Please read this with me. We believe that mankind is unable to satisfy God's penalty for sin. We believe salvation is possible through faith because Jesus' death and resurrection covers the condemnation a believer deserves and grants the believer righteousness they don't deserve. And then pause, we'll, we'll get into 2 Corinthians. Because these core belief statements are based on Scripture. If they're not, throw them out. Throw them out. But they connect to Scripture. But I want you to see uh, uh, something about this. Last time we preached on this in our, our whole series on core beliefs, we mainly talked about that top part. Because we love salvation because Jesus saves us from sin. Say amen if Jesus saved you. Amen. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. So we spent a lot of time on that last time, on faith. But this week, we're going to focus more on this, this second part, this latter part. I've got those two underlined words, condemnation. Is that a happy word? No? Who here wants to be condemned? No, no. If you do, you don't know what the word means. That's the word that sums up our ideas of, of hell and judgment. And, you know, if you're talking to a two-year-old, getting in trouble. But then we've got the other underlined word, righteousness. Is that a good word? Yes. Yes, that word sums up all the things that God desires for our life and for the world and in Christ. What we're going to see today is with that, with that from and for idea that's in these two big theology words, is there are two sides to salvation. We are saved from something, in this case, condemnation. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But we are also saved for something. And that matters. Let, let me show you why this matters on this next slide. we got a picture here. Uh, pastor draws from time to time. Isn't that a good? Get, say it. No, don't say amen. No, it's not a good drawing. Uh, don't, don't praise my works before men. Um, what we have here is this is sort of a metaphor and idea, a picture that I use to think of this idea. This is the idea of the pit and the mountain. So, Oftentimes, if you're hearing teaching or preaching on salvation or what did Jesus do for us, we've got this, this pit here, uh, which I have the word condemnation on. What color is that line? Can you guys see it? Oh, it's sort of washed out. It's red. It's yucky. You don't want to be there. Uh, and, and, you know, you could fill that pit with all sorts of gross stuff. I've got the word condemn in there. You can also put the word hell in there. You can put the word judgment in there. You can put the word shame in there. Do you want to be in the pit in this picture? No. And so oftentimes when we're, when we're hearing teaching about salvation, they'll say the cross and the resurrection. That's what that little cross and then the up arrow means. The cross and resurrection is sort of like a ladder that gets us out of the pit. That gets us out of it. So we're saved from our sins. But then we, we come to a thing that is not in our core belief statement and something that is not in Scripture. And then we say, I'm, I'm out of the pit. I'm not down there. 
but now I've got some work to do. What, what's, on the right side, what's on the right side of that screen? That yellow mountain. Mountain. Are mountains easy to climb? No, they take work. They take effort. And, this, and up there I have the word right uh, or the word righteousness from our core belief statement. And this is all that God wants for your life, all that God wants for the world. And, and I'll hear Christians, even in this own church, they say, I got to get my rear in gear. So it's like we've come to the middle. We're in this little flat spot. I'm not in the pit. Jesus built, got the cross, got me out of the pit. I got to start climbing. I got to start working. Or I hear someone who calls himself a Christian. They say, I'm so glad Jesus saved me from hell. I'll do that holy stuff later. That, that mountain's so big, I will tackle that later. I'll do that Christian. Th those holy rollers go to church on Sunday. I'm saved from hell. I'll deal with that later. And they're content to be in the middle. But uh, what I want us to see is from our core belief statement, we've got this next picture. This, this is what we actually believe if you read our core belief statement right. And there's a lot of drawings up there, and I'll help you see it. But notice, where is the person standing in this picture? Are they in the pit? Yes or no? Are they in the middle? Yes or no? Are they on the mountain? Yes. Here's what our core belief statement means. It means that Christ has saved us from that pit. He saved us from that condemnation. God doesn't look at you and say, that one is in rebellion. That one is under judgment. Instead, he looks at you through the blood and cross of Christ and doesn't say, and they got some work to do. And doesn't say, and they're so lazy. Instead, he looks at you and he sees the full righteousness of Christ. Amen? So in our drawing here, we have, we are saved from condemnation and we are saved for righteousness and here here's what i've got there before we only had the one cross to sort of function as a ladder you know jesus thanks for helping me get out of that i've got some work to do uh who has ever ridden a ski lift that does a ski lift usually take you to the top of the mountain yes so in this very bad not good metaphor you know i could work on it more what christ does on the cross in his resurrection by paying the penalty for our sin but also granting us righteousness we don't deserve there is a ski lift all the way from the pit of hell to the full righteousness of Christ. And that is what Christ has bought for you. That is what Christ has claimed for you in salvation. But look at your feet. Your feet right now. What we need to ask ourselves spiritually in our life is where are we standing? Where are we standing? Are we aware that we are standing in the presence of the full righteousness of Christ? Do we live that way? Do we think that way? Are we looking down at the pit and saying, I'm glad I'm not there? Or we think that there's some mountain we have to climb to earn more righteousness. You're at the top. That's what Christ has bought for you. But you may say, man, I hadn't heard it that way. Well, here's the truth. If I'm teaching it and it's not in Scripture, is it a lie? Yes. So let's take it to Scripture. Anybody that says, let me teach you something they don't connect it to Scripture is a liar. Let's go to this next slide, 2 Corinthians 5. And you'll see this pattern of we are saved from something and for something over and over. So you guys are going to help me out just with a passage we cited in here. So you're looking for the I'm saved from something. That's that pit idea. And I'm saved for something. That's that mountain idea. So I'll just read. We, we have just the first two verses up here. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Uh, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So I'll give you guys this first one. You get a free answer, a free space. Uh, what we see in the beginning part is, is Paul is referencing for this church. You had a worldly point of view. You looked at the world, and you were doing your best with your eyes, with the circumstances you've been given, but it was worldly. And you regarded Christ a certain way, and you looked at those people at your workplace a certain way. But now, so we are saved from that, so we are saved for, the opposite of a worldly point of view is a what? Non-worldly point of view. You see how that works? You were saved from a worldly point of view for a non-worldly point of view, or a heavenly point of view viewing things from Christ's perspective. And then this one, I hope you can get this. Do you think you can? Do you think you can fill in the blank? We are saved from old creation for new, what? New creation. New creation. That's what Paul is talking about here. You are saved from that thing that is dying, that is passing away 
for something that is amazing, that is in the full righteousness of Christ. Let's go to this next slide. Let's keep on going through 2 Corinthians 5. Is what I'm teaching in God's Word. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, and uh, yes, 19 as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the word to him, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of what? What does it say in the Bible? Reconciliation. And that's a word, who here used the word reconciliation this week? Not, not too many. Uh, Linda does, that's good, that's good. We don't use it very often. Reconciliation uh, is usually a lawyery word for us, but it's the idea there are two parties, two friends, two family members, and they are separated. There's a problem. There's a division. If somebody brought the wrong side to Thanksgiving. There is a fight going on. And so what we have at this beginning part is God reconciled us to himself, which, which means that before God reconciled us, are we against God, or are we connected to God before God reconciles us? We are against God. Uh, we hear in Scripture that even though we were enemies with God, there's no halfway mark. You are either reconciled to God, or you are against God. But what we see here is that God has reconciled us. So then we, here's, our, here's our, our for and our from idea. So if we are saved for the ministry of reconciliation that's what paul is saying you now go out and tell the world that god is is reconciling people that means we were saved from unreconciliation we were saved from unforgiveness we were saved from being out of relationship with god for the ministry of reconciliation does god say i'm so glad that we're on the same team now sit tight i'll take care of everything no we are challenged to go out with the ministry of of reconciliation. So we have that from and for idea. This next slide, make sure we see it in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of what? God. So this one's pretty, pretty easy. I won't belabor it to us too much. In this verse, we learn we are saved from what? Sin. And, and just how tragic it is. We're saved from sin because whenever God looked at Jesus on the cross, that's where your sin was. That, that, that's how it works. I, I can't fathom it. It wasn't my plan, but that was God's. So we are saved from sin for what? What do we learn in God's word? Righteousness. God traded, exchanged somehow the, the, the relationship, what he had going with Jesus to where he would look at his son and see our sin so that we, rebellious humans, would be the image of the righteousness of God. And we can talk more about the theology of sanctification, what that looks like, and how, but we are saved from sin for the righteousness of God. What we learn in 2 Corinthians 5 is, does God want us sitting right there in the middle? No. He takes us all the way from the pit to the top. So let's look at this summary of this passage, this idea. In case you're wondering, yeah, this, this might be a quick sermon. Salvation is a saved from something and a saved for something kind of thing you're saved from the pit for the top of the mountain jesus gives us his righteousness and so i just want to look at some applications of this idea you will find this over and over in scripture god doesn't stop redemption halfway he's an all the way kind of redemption god so let's go to this this next idea this next passage and i, I just pick these out as things that could be applicable here but you'll find this principle of from something for something over and over in scripture so we'll go i'll just read it from the from the slide on this one from worthlessness for what what does it say on the slide kingdom kingdom and so jesus over and over in his ministry talks about the kingdom of god 
And uh, understanding these, it is not wrong, it is not wicked to say God has saved me from something. But we want to make sure in our thinking about what Jesus has done for us that we see the full extent. So someone may say in their life, before I read Matthew 13, I'm so glad kept me, I'm so glad God kept me from throwing my life away. Not your head, yes, if you could have ever said that. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad God kept me from throwing my life away. Behind, behind that idea is I was worthless. I was messing it up. I was going to throw it away. But we learn in Scripture, it's not just you are saved from that worthlessness, but we learn this in Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. What we see in this parable, Jesus is teaching us about the kingdom and teaching us about our worth. What is this, this pearl merchant's job? To buy and sell what? Pearls. He is hunting for it. A, a, a brief, this isn't the full teaching on this parable, but in this story, we're the pearl merchants. We're searching for value. And in this story, the way he talks about it is, does this pearl merchant trade all of his value, all of what he was looking for and striving for, for the pearl, this pearl of great value? Yes. That there's no plan for the next step. There's not saying, oh, but that, that pearl is going to depreciate in value, and if I want to make sure that I pay my, my corporate taxes, then i got to save some back. He has traded all, of he ha- all that he has, this striving for this, this worthwhileness of this pearl. What that means for us is with regard to the kingdom of God is we'll, we'll walk through life with this, this sort of pitiable story. I'm so glad God, God kept me from throwing my life away. I almost was worthless. And we'll be stuck right there in the middle. But we need to remember as we are saved from worthlessness for full citizenship, full value in the kingdom of heaven. Say amen if you have full citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. We, we often don't reflect on that. We're busy looking at our past, at that pit we got out of, and we're not looking at our feet. Are you a full citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and will any power of Satan or man ever change that? No. It's not just that you are saved from worthlessness. You have a table in the kingdom of God. You have citizenship there. So we are saved from worthlessness for the kingdom. Let's go to this next one. From slavery for what? Freedom. And, and I know I've heard people say this. And, and hear me again. These aren't bad things to say. These are good. But these are only half of what needs to be said. I'm so glad God released me from that addiction. Nod your head, yes, you can say that. I'm so glad God can God release me from that addiction. And, and that is good, and that is true. But, but we see that there is an even bigger view that we need. That's looking down at the pit. There was an addiction there. There, there. there was something controlling my life there. But we're not looking at the full scope that we have on the mountain. Galatians 5.1 says this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of what? Slavery. Slavery. What we had here is this Galatian church, and and once again, this isn't a full teaching on this passage. They they had tasted some uh, of the release that Christ brought them. They, They were pagans. They had no idea who Jesus was, no idea who the God of Abraham was. And they had gotten some of that freedom, and it meant they were freed from idols. But now teachers were coming in and saying, and now you must observe the law, and now you must be circumcised, and there's all this work you have to do. There's a mountain you have to climb. And what Paul's reminding him here, did Jesus come to save you from one thing? No. Did he come to save you from one addiction? Did he come to save you from one unbelief? No, the truth in this passage, you are saved from slavery And it is for freedom that Christ has set us, what? Free. 
And so we see if we, if we look past our, our pit mindset, we begin to look at our life from the mountaintop of righteousness that Christ has bought us, and we don't just say, man, I'm so glad Jesus saved me from that, that he freed me from that, but we now demand freedom in all of our life. Not that you go up to your employer, your boss, and say, hey, you're no longer the boss of me. That won't work very well. No, what it is is you look at your life. What would bind you? What false thoughts? What untrue teaching? What other addictions that you have let slip by? I, I'm, so, I'm so glad that Jesus has, has freed me. He has delivered me from my addiction to smoking. But man, my, my tongue, my cursing, my bitterness, my envy, I guess I'll just have to deal with that for the rest of my life. Is that the testimony of the gospel? No, for freedom, Christ has set you free. Daily demand freedom. So let's go to this next slide. We've got more, more just practical application of this from something for something. And this one's important. This one, make sure you hear this. This is important for all of your life because uh, hear this rightly, Christian. After Christ has, has bought you with his blood and redeemed you through his, his cross and resurrection, will your sin ever put you in danger of hell, of eternal judgment? No, no. If Jesus bought it, you can't buy it back. He's more important. He's bigger than you. But why is sin a problem for believers? Why is it? That's what we're going to see in, in this slide here. But let me tell you the good thing first, the thing that, that, that is sort of that pit idea that we can do better than. You'll have a believer, someone who has declared Jesus as Lord and Savior, repented of their sins, and they'll say a statement like this, I'm so glad Jesus made me not go to what? Hell. The, the joke among Baptist preachers is we're not selling fire insurance. But many of us think that way. Oh, there's a, there's a pit? There's an actual pit of judgment? I don't want to go there. I hope Jesus can save me from that. And he can. And even if, if your belief is not full, even if you come to Christ and, and you abuse him and use him, guess what? That's what he died for. So, so don't hear me wrongly. It's not that your sin is making you go to hell. If Christ has redeemed you, he's redeemed you. But here's why the sin matters. Here's why the sin matters. Let's look at this, this uh, passage. I'll go ahead and turn there to John, since we've been preaching through John. John 9. And we have here John 9, 35. I'll read these verses and then explain the context and how it teaches us this from hell and this for worship idea. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he what? Worshipped him. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, and that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Oh, it's a good story. That was the healing, the miracle uh, that we had before Lazarus. It was the healing of the man born blind. And we learned in that story that all of that healing, all of the setup, is for the glory of God. And it's for Jesus to declare who he is. But we see in this story, and I could have picked lots of other healings. Did Jesus heal a few people in the Bible? Yes, yes, he does. Um, he heals a few people. Some of the people, after he heals them, he says, go and sin no more. But if you think of the stories in Scripture, and certainly this one, there often is a reaction by the person who is healed. What does this guy do after he says, Lord, I believe, and he what? Worshiped. You don't see Jesus going around in Scripture I've healed you, now remember to worship me. It's not how he operates. It is so obvious, it is so evident, if this is the Son of God, the Word of God, who has redeemed this person and healed them from their deathliness and their sin, duh, you worship him. So here's the issue. Here's why sin matters to a believer. It's because sin interferes with our worship of Christ. I'll say it again. Sin interferes with our worship of Christ. Whenever we are coming to worship Jesus, and we see this whenever Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. If you have sin, confess it. Jesus can handle it, but you can't. If you are to worship 
Christ, you want sin out of the way. You want it confessed. You want it brought before the cross, not hidden because it's your favorite. So we see that we are saved from sin. But not so I can feel good about myself. Not so I can be self-righteous. But for worship. Whenever you get to heaven, the sign over the door is going to say, aren't you glad you didn't go to hell? It's going to say, now let's praise Jesus. Amen? We are saved from sin for worship. Let's go to this next slide, this next practical idea. This is our last one. This is a big deal. You've heard this verse before. I'll read the verse first this time, and then I'll talk about the idea that only goes halfway. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Uh, nod your head, yes, you heard that, voice, that verse before. Mama told you. Mama told you that verse. You were bought with a price. And, and the halfway idea, the idea that is only looking at the pit and not taking into mind the mountain of righteousness, is someone who says, I'm so glad I'm friends with Jesus. And we've, we've got people that say that, and that is true, and that is good, and we sing the song. You know, I, I'm so glad I'm friends with Jesus. That is good. And we look at this verse, and, and Linda Lunday talks about these ideas with the children up here. She's been saying, Jesus is a big deal, and he thinks you are one too. Jesus doesn't die for you because he doesn't think he can make you of great worth. He dies for you to redeem you. So, of course, Jesus is your friend. But did you know verse 20 is plural? It's not you, Allison, or you, Jim, were bought with a great price. It is you. It is you, church. After all, is the body of Christ, Pastor Daniel. No. And so this is why this idea is important. Because if we're just looking at the pit, we're able to say, I'm so glad I'm friends with Jesus. He's my buddy. He's the one who died for me. But then all my life I say, I don't need that religious mumbo jumbo. I don't need to be gathered with the church. I don't need to worship with my brothers and sisters. Well, guess what? Whenever you are in the full presence of Christ, we will all be there worshiping him. So you can either get used to that now or you'll get used to it later. So we are saved from isolation for community. And that community is messy and it is hard, but it is how Christ is producing his body through the church. So we see we are saved from and we are saved for. And so let's go to this last slide. Don't miss this. Like I said, it's a, it's a quick one. Unbeliever, do you believe, and you got to answer this in your heart, do you believe Jesus can save you from sin, judgment, and every ailment of your soul? That matters. That is the eternal question. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? He is either the one through his cross and resurrection can save you from anything the pit has to offer. And so today we will have our time of invitation. And what that means is you are invited to receive Christ today. It matters. You only have so many days. Don't get the answer to the question wrong. So I'll be up here during the time of invitation, unbeliever. But also believer, and this is, this is mainly a believer sermon. This is mainly, if you want the theology word, sanctification. For believers, are you content with the saved froms? You know, I'm, I'm so glad Jesus saved me from that addiction. I'm so glad Jesus uh, is my friend. I'm, I'm so glad uh, that, that Jesus has done something for me. Now I don't have to go to hell while starving the saved fours. The, the reality from God's perspective is he doesn't look at you in the pit. You're no longer there. He doesn't look at you halfway. You've got work to do. He looks at you at the full righteousness of Christ. Look at your feet. Look at your feet one more time. Where are they? Do you view them in your circumstances where you're at in some worldly way? Do you still have that worldly vision that Paul writes about? Or, or do you praise God? Do you desire to move 
from one freedom to another, from one glory to another? Or are you saying, I really like it at the base of the mountain. That's where I feel comfortable. So that's our challenge today. That's our message. We are not just saved from something, not just from that condemnation, but for the full righteousness of Christ.